Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. As we make our way back to our seats, it feels good to be in the house of the Lord. Ah, I love his presence. I love his people. There's nothing like it. Amen. As you're reaching for your Bibles, we're going to go to the book of Luke. Hallelujah. As you're turning there, I want to just give a quick update on some things that are transpiring in Next Town Ministries. It is a branch of this church, an extension of this church, and I am thankful to be a part of a mission-minded church. And um, for those who do know, and maybe those who do not know, uh, past few months we have been doing Bible study groups, reaching out into various towns, Millbank, Webster, and God has blessed us with a miracle building in Millbank, still in the process of fixing that up, but we we meet at... Uh, community center in Millbank every Monday and every Tuesday. We meet uh, in a community room in the courthouse in Webster. And then starting this week, we will begin meeting at a library in Brookings. And so there is a group of five uh, people that we'll be meeting with starting this Wednesday. Very excited about the opportunity. And uh, I don't know what the number 45 is all about, but every town's 45 miles away. Uh, it'd be nice if it was 4.5 miles away, but they're 45 miles away. But every town needs to hear the word, needs the gospel, and I'm thankful to be part of that. And uh, one another awesome thing, uh, you know, last month Richard from Millbank was baptized and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, and uh, I'm just so excited for what God's doing in his life. Uh, I wish he was still living in Millbank, but he got a job transfer into California. And the, the inspiration, the anointing, the moving in my spirit that I feel is just like God saw it fit just before he transitioned that our paths would intersect. That's how much God loves a soul. And I'm thankful that we obeyed the Holy Ghost. I was telling the team that I feel like we need to be very upfront and direct right away. And so we got right into this new birth, Acts 238 message. And uh, when he broke down and started sharing that he's been thinking about baptism for 20 years, I'm thankful that we obeyed the Holy Ghost and just shared what we believe and to see him born again. And the uh, good thing is he's right uh, between two great churches in the area that he's at. I gave him that information. And so I'll be praying for Richard. And be praying for Next Town Ministries in Brookings as we begin to meet this week. We're going to book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 1. Give honor to Pastor Jared and his wife and this church. I thank God under their leadership, this church is going forward, it's going further. Last week was an all-time attendance record, 110 people in the house of the Lord last week. How about that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so it is within the realm of this church's reach to have consistently over 100 in this church on Sunday. It wasn't Christmas. It wasn't Easter. It was just simply us making an effort to reach out to people in this community. And so continue that reach. We don't have to wait for an announcement to reach out to people to bring them. Continue to bring them. And so, amen, amen. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. If you're there, say amen. <coughs> I might have to speak a little slow, softly, and drink a lot of water. I don't know, ever since family camp, I don't know, the pines got me or what, but I just got a little irritant in the back of my throat for the past four weeks that just will not go away. Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it came to pass that as he was praying, someone say praying, Jesus was praying. And so if Jesus, who was sinless, Prayed, how much more should us who are sinful pray? And he was praying in a certain place, and when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Someone say pray. Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. After three years, someone finally worked up the courage to ask Jesus to teach him how to pray. All of us start at the same place. We do not know how to pray. We don't know even where to begin to pray. But we must begin to ask God, Lord, teach me 
to pray. I want to be a person of prayer. I want to speak just for the next few moments here about a teacher called prayer. Let's pray that God's will would be done here this morning. Jesus, I love you. Thank you for the privilege, the honor, the opportunity to be gathered together here in Watertown with the saints of the Most High. I do not believe in coincidence. I do not believe in chance. I don't believe in some random occurrence. I believe the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I believe, God, that you have brought these people here today because you have ordered, you have led, you have guided, you have led their steps to this time in this moment. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that not a single spirit that is contrary to the Holy Spirit would quench it. I pray, God, that you have free course and liberty. Lord, release my voice and I pray you you open up ears to hear. And in the name of Jesus, Lord, that we would be vessels unto honor. I believe you have a plan and a purpose for this day, for this people. And Lord, we do not want to pass by the time to say that we had service. And Lord, we do no service to you. But I believe, God, that much will be made of this moment here. In the name of Jesus, we ask. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody say in Jesus' name. A teacher called prayer. The primary purpose of prayer is relationship with God. But the typical progression of a person that begins to add prayer to their life is as follows. Typically, it starts with forgiveness. We are praying, we are talking to God, asking Him for forgiveness. If we advance a little further... We will begin to repent, not just say, God, I am sorry for my sins, but Lord, I want to turn from my sins. After that, the next natural progression is petitions or requests, where we begin to talk to God and submit to him needs in our lives or in the lives of others. Forgiveness, repentance, and petitions all are part of of prayer and communication with God. Unfortunately, so few go beyond needs-based prayers into what we would call relationship-based prayers. We typically go to God because we are in need. And the truth of the matter is we will always be in need as long as we are alive and as long as there is God. We have need. We must always come to God in our point of need. But a mark of maturity in prayer is walking into the realms of relationship. And in those realms, there's three things I want to quickly identify when it comes to having a communication or relationship with God in what we're calling prayer. One is thanksgiving. If you are going to talk to God, if you are going to be a person of prayer, you need to be a person that gives God thanks. Thank Him that He forgave you of His sins. Thank Him that He has turned you from your sins. Thank Him that He has heard the need that you have brought to Him. Thank Him for anything positive in your life. Not only that, but moving forward from a spirit of thanksgiving, as Verbal Bean said in one of his writings and his uh, uh, meetings in talking about prayer, thanksgiving being the most untapped channel of prayer, the most unused channel of prayer. May that not be said of us, but adoration, begin to compliment God, adore him, worship him, praise him, all stemming from adoration. God, I adore you. God, I praise you. God, I worship you. God, I love you. God, I honor you. This is a mark of maturity in prayer. And thirdly would be direction. Direction, asking God what his prayer request is. God, I'm, I'm giving you my request. I'm giving you my need. I'm asking you to take care of this, that, or the other. But God, I want to ask you, what is it you want? What is it you desire? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Where do you want me to go? How would you have me to live? There is... A seismic difference from going to God asking forgiveness, repentance, and petitions to going to the place of, God, I thank you. God, I love you. God, what do you want? May it happen in every single person under the sound of my voice. That is the will of God 
for us to get into that realm of relationship in prayer. But also do recognize that God does tell us to bring our needs to Him. There is a common mindset that I have come across, typically in males, and that is that simply, I don't want to bring this need to God, I've already done it before. God already knows this need. I've already told him, why do I need to keep telling God about this petition? Jesus is the one who said to come to him continually and repeatedly. He said this in two instances, there's more, but Luke chapter 11 and Luke chapter 18. Jesus, in the same gospel, in the same book, just seven chapters apart, said, I want you to continually come to me with your request. I want you to continually come to me in your petition. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, who is very acquainted with prayer and relationship, said, In everything by prayer and supplication, make your request made known unto God. Continually, repeatedly, Talk to God about your needs, even if it's the same one you have talked to him about for 12 years. Some would say, I don't know what else to say to God. But from that same mouth, the same situation is brought to the ears of others that are not God, but are human. And they proceed to open up to others without realizing that we will extensively talk to everyone about our need. We will talk into great detail about our need to others, but not as much with God. We don't do it intentionally, but we should take note of it. If you could sit at a coffee shop, if you could sit on your phone, if you could sit at your laptop and begin to voice the concerns of your life, the cares of your life, the drama, the circumstance, the situation of health, and begin to talk to someone for 30 minutes about what is going on in your world. If you could talk to said individual for one hour, two hours, multiple times throughout the week, multiple times throughout the day, though you've already opened up the issue and talked about it, you revisit the issue and talk about it. If we can do that with a husband, with a wife, if we could do that with a friend or family member, or even a complete stranger who just asks us what's going on in our world, and all of a sudden we begin to unload, how much more so should we be that way with God? God who created you, God who loves you, God who has all power. I can share my situation to my wife, and there are some needs that she can tend to that I can discuss But there are other things I share that there is no way in which she can aid my circumstance. She can only offer a hearing ear. We serve a God that has a hearing ear. But he has a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And God can interject himself into your situation. And through his divine providence, bring an answer to what we call prayer. I would encourage you to be more specific with God in your prayer. Be more detailed with God in your prayer. Peter said in chapter 5, verse 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Interesting in this verse, the English word care is used twice. Care and careth. But in the Greek, these are two different words. The first word, casting your care. That word care is through the idea of distraction. Our cares in this world that begin to weigh on our mind will distract us without us realizing it. The idea of casting your care is solicitude, but it stems from the idea of distraction. The cares of this world, what weighs on your mind will easily Distract you. The next word, careth, is from the Greek word mellow. I kind of like that. I can remember that. Mellow. Which means to be in interest of. To concern. Bring your distraction to the one that is interested. When you and I are stressed out, we can talk to the one who is 
mellow. We can talk to the one who is calm in our storm. When the disciples on that ship were in the storm, they were casting some cares. There was high level anxiety. But the one walking into that storm was mellow. And he had interest in those that were casting their cares. He had a hearing ear. He had concern towards them. The one who is interested. The one who is concerned. If we would share our needs with him. When you, when I share our need with God. It is an act of faith that believes he is interested. When you open up your mouth and begin to talk to God. It is a step of faith saying, I believe he's interested. I have cares that are distracting me from accomplishing a high level of effectiveness in the kingdom of God or in my family or whatever. But when I pause, I slow down and open my mouth and begin to cast my cares on the one who cares for me. The one who is interested in me. It is me communicating God. I believe you are listening and I believe you are concerned and I believe you are more interested in my life and in my situation, even more so than I am aware of my own circumstance and my own situation. We can mellow out when we give him our distractions, our cares, because when we begin to cast cares upon him, he begins to dispense a peace that surpasses all Of our understanding. God. He has a purpose. For our prayers of petitions. There's a variety of prayer. There's levels of prayer. There are categories of prayer. But I do want to revert back to petitions. We should mature and grow. And begin to have relationship with God. But you know petitions are part of relationship. Needs are part of relationship. And in Luke 18, 1, Jesus, in his word, as we read about a parable, he speaks to his disciples that men ought always to pray. Not just Sundays, but always. God wants you in your relationship with him to go beyond Sundays and talk to him every day. We ought always to pray. In the parable, he shares about you and I consistently, continually, repeatedly praying. He says, there was a city. In this city was a judge. He did not fear God. He did not regard man. In that same city, there was a widow. She came to the judge and she said, avenge me of mine adversary. He would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual, ongoing, persistent coming to me and talking to me about the same request day in and day out, she will wear me out. And so the Lord says, listen, hear what the unjust judge just said. Shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night? There is that continual prayer. There is that daily prayer. There is that multiple times within a day prayer. That's another mark of maturity. Not just to talk to God on Sundays and not just to talk to God every day but to talk to him multiple times a day. Don't pigeonhole God to just one segment of your day. Involve God throughout the day. Talk to him throughout the course of the day unfolding. But the Bible says, hear this unjust judge. God will avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him. Though he bear long, someone say bear long. Though he bears long with them, I tell you, he will avenge them. Someone say speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man returns, will he find faith on the earth? You've heard this taught before here that God was concerned about our prayer condition 
in the last days before his return? Will he find this type of prayer life in the last days when he returns? When Jesus returns, will he find you watching and praying or just watching Netflix or something that is not kingdom minded? I pray in the name of Jesus that on the day of his return, he finds faithful people that pray every day. But let's take a closer look at this picture Jesus is painting in this parable that we just read. There are two very different characters in this story. Namely, it is a man and a woman. Can't get much more different than that, though society would try to attempt to blur the lines. Further defined, this man, this woman, is a judge and a widow. The man is the judge, the woman is the widow. And in biblical times, a woman was on the lower class societally. That was just the historical reality of that day. And a widow woman was at the bottom of the barrel. Basically, they could not survive without a provider that typically was the man. That is the way it happened in society. That someone that was a lady was not given the rights and the liberties that we are able to experience in the day and age which you and I live in, such as education and and, and, and good paying jobs, so on and so forth. But even today, a lady that is a widow, that is trying to take care of a child or multiple children, it is a real struggle to make ends meet and to provide. You, 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 oh, there's, we, we know some uh, people in this community. There's one in particular that we're thinking of that they're, um, she's working two to three jobs just to provide for the kids, just to provide food for the family. But there's more than money and food that needs provided for the family. There needs to be parental interaction to properly provide for a child. If you are here today and you are able to have time with your child, you ought to thank God for that blessing and make the most of that time. Your child needs more than money and your child needs more than clothes and your child needs more than food. They need a father or a mother and God willing both in their life that are training them and raising them and loving them. We have a great responsibility upon us as parents. But here, this widow woman in these days was at the bottom of the barrel. There was nothing that could be done for she was a widow. But she knew where to go if she wanted justice. But there is a problem in this parable. The judge is unjust. The one that is positioned to bring justice is unjust. Therefore, they live, she lives in a unjust world, an unjust society where things are not taken care of properly. And he would not help her. But the good news is that she would not quit. Though he would not help, she would not quit quit. I want you to know society ain't that much different. Though there are some things that are improved in today's world versus this world, there's some things that haven't changed at all. This world cannot meet every single one of your needs. And though they cannot help, do not quit. Do not quit when this world cannot help. There is a heavenly father that wants you to come to him and open up your mouth and begin to vote God, I need you. But eventually, she got what she requested. She got what she requested because she would not quit. Let us catch the lesson. A wicked judge answered the consistent request of a desperate widow woman. 
And if a wicked judge would answer a consistent request of a desperate widow, don't you believe that God is going to be better to his children that cry to him night and day? The world, the word that Jesus uses here is elect, which means chosen, which means his favorite. God says, you are my favorite. You're not some brat I look at that's on the floor pitching a fit crying. I look at you as my chosen one. You are my favorite child. And so I want you to talk to me about where you need help both night and day. Do not stop talking to me about your need night and day. No matter no matter what it is, if you have a health issue, talk to Jesus about it night and day. If you have a financial issue, talk to Jesus about it night and day. If you don't have a support group, namely something like this church, talk to Jesus about it night and day. Because I promise you, there is a family here that will love you, that will nurture you, that will pray for you, that will help you. But you got to talk about it both night and day. Hallelujah. 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 Let us not miss the other opposing element in this story. And that is verse 7 and verse 8. Shall not God avenge his own elect, his chosen, his favorite, that cry to him day and night, though he bear long with them? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. The opposing statements is, though he bear long, he will avenge speedily. How opposite is that? How perplexing or confusing can that be? That it's going to take a long time, but God will do it quick. This will be really fast. Just you got to slow down and watch how fast this is. Like, though he bear long, he will avenge them speedily. How can it be both at the same time? Long and speedily. Bear long means long-spirited, forbearing, and patient. It is insight into the character of God, though he bear long. God's character, his ways are not our ways. God is long-spirited. God is forbearing. God is patient. He is patient. Us, not so much. Not so much. Realize the one that you're talking to night and day is patient. We impatiently say, I need this done now. God says, I, I got you. Okay, I need it done now. I hear you. But right now, yeah, sure you bet you now, don't you know? He's forbearing. He's patient. He's long-spirited. But hear me, God wants us to pray long enough until we arrive at the place where we realize our need of him. God is long-spirited, and in the realm of prayer, God wants to extend your prayer time with him about said issue. I know it seems emergent, and we need it right here, right now. But God says, I want to take this prayer request of yours, and I want to stretch it out as long as I can to get as much of you in this situation as I can. Because yes, right now, I can turn everything around in your world, but I want to make the most of this season in your life, and I want to stretch you, and I want to work on you, and I want to open up arenas in your world that you've not dealt with but if you would be patient with me I've been patient with you let me help you now it's one thing to say I need him it's another thing to be in that place of need because if we had open karaoke and pass this mic around we'd probably all say yeah I need God I need God I need God I need God in a real way I need God in a bad way I need him now but when you actually are smack dab in the thick of it, that realization of need is to magnify. But not everything that needs to magnify in the situation comes to the forefront as it should. Sometimes it gets buried by other emotions that come ahead of it and cut. And that's why God says, I, I got to be long-spirited in this. 
I got I to work with you in a forbearing manner, a patient manner, because there's more to this than meets the eye. The Lord wants to strip our mindset so bare that there is nothing left but humble reliance. That's the place God wants you and I to be. He could change it right here, right now, and we can all get our you know party horns out, and we could do a big dance, and we can have a good time. But see, God... He's long spirited. He's forbearing. He's patient. And he wants you in your season, your mindset so bare. There is nothing left to it but a humble reliance upon God. If prayer was answered instantaneously every time, it would not require faith because it's merely a formula. It's a gimmick. It's just a push of a button. It doesn't, there's things I do every day that require no faith whatsoever. I just expect it to be so. Which there is a sense of expectation in the realm of faith. But God does not want your prayer to be thoughtless, to be heartless, to be emotionless. God wants your heart in that prayer, in that request. God wants your spirit in that prayer, in that request. Not, you know, some bippity boppity boo, you know, put it together. What do you got? And all of a sudden, boom, God just gives it to you because you prayed some sort of prayer. Because you got this, this perfect little ironed out prayer with no wrinkles in it. God wants more. Than some formula of prayer. See, some prayers build faith in others' faithfulness. God wants to build faithfulness from our prayers of faith. Jesus' lesson on prayer does not cease. It continues. Look at verse 9 on. He speaks this parable. And he says, there's those that trust in themselves. In their righteousness. And they despise others. So this spirit of trusting self in your own personal righteousness that you lean on to and mistreatment of others, he says, I found it in the religious sect. Two men go to church to pray. Prayer is a good thing. There's a Pharisee, there's a publican. The Pharisee stands and he prays thus with himself. God, help me not just to be praying. It's just me there. I want God there. God, I thank thee. I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust. Can we just read about an unjust ruler, judge, adulterers, even as this publican is right by me? I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything that comes my way. But the publican, standing far off, He would not even lift up so much his eyes to heaven. But he began to smite his chest and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that that man, that publican went down. He returned to his house justified more so than the Pharisee. For everyone that exalts himself will be abased and everyone that humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisee prayed, fasted, and gave tithes. These are spiritual disciplines that all of us need to live out. Pray, fast, tithes. There's other things as well, but that's a pretty good beginning. But see, we can pray, we can fast, do what's right, all the while living wrong. I don't pray because I trust myself. I pray because I trust God. The opening statement Jesus said is, this man that came to pray trusted himself. I don't pray because I trust myself. I pray because I don't trust myself. This heart of mine is deceitful, desperately wicked above all things. That's why I pray, because I don't trust this thing to lead me. I don't want my heart to lead me. I don't want my emotions to lead me. I want God to lead me. I pray because I trust God, not because I trust myself. We don't pray because we are righteous, because this man went to God praying, trusting in his own righteousness. We don't pray because we're righteous. We pray because God is. God, when we talk to him in prayer, prayer is not a place where we go to compare 
to others. If he was beginning to pray, he says, I thank God I'm not as others. And he begins to name drop some extreme sins. And then he even goes to the point where he says, and that guy right there. That guy right there in the same house of worship. I'm, I'm thankful I'm not him. God forbid that ever get in this church. Where we can stand in the same room and look across and say, I thank God I'm not them. No, I thank God that I have a testimony. And the same testimony you gave me, God, I'm believing you're going to give it to them. Because God is not a respecter of persons. God operates and moves in the realm of restoration and revival. Prayer is not a place where we go to compare to others. Because if we pray correctly, we'll receive context and we will receive content from the Father. Context meaning God will put everything in perspective. Content meaning God will give you something of substance when you exit out of that prayer closet. I don't go to that closet to pray to compare myself to be more spiritual than anyone else in this room or on this planet. I pray because God, I need some context to what's going on right now. I pray because I need some content from God, something that's going to carry me through the hell that I'm going through right now. Can we lift our hands? Can we lift our voices? Can you pray with me for just a moment? Come on, would you pray with me, church, for just a moment? I would that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we lift up hands. Lord, not in accusation. We lift up hands, not pointing our finger to you or to others. God, we lift our hands and say, Lord, give me some context in what's going on right now. And God, give me some content and to carry on through this circumstance. In the name of Jesus, would you clap your hands to the Lord? Why must we pray daily? Why must we pray continually to a God who knows everything? We're not praying for God to catch up with us. We're praying to catch up with God. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We do not pray to inform God. We pray to align with God. Think of your prayer session as getting together with the chiropractor. And then trying to line up that spine that's out of whack, that neck out of joint. God, I need an alignment. And so I pray. Hear me, I, I, the, these next few moments, I really feel focused on what to say to this church. Praying in the Spirit prepares our spirit. While we pray daily for the healing, while we pray daily for the saving of someone else's soul, we may not even realize that it's for the healing or the saving of our own soul. Often I have went into seasons of prayer and fasting for someone or something only by the end of that prayer and fasting season to realize in the process I was praying and fasting for myself. Think of Jesus praying in the garden before he goes to the cross. He invites Peter James and John, because Jesus' soul is exceedingly sorrowful. They, Peter, James, John, are asked to pray for Jesus. Jesus, imagine Jesus say, hey, can you pray for me? Pray for Jesus. Yeah. But because they didn't pray for him, they weren't spiritually ready for them. When the opposition came and that moment came, though they were supposed to be praying for Jesus, they fell asleep and they weren't ready for what was coming. Jesus said in verse 38, my, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even to death. Terry here, watch with me. Pray with me. He comes to the disciples. He finds them asleep. He says to Peter, couldn't you can you extend some time to pray with me? Pray with me for an hour. This is why I want you to pray. So you don't enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh is weak. Peter, I can imagine his mind. Wait, wait, wait. I thought this prayer was about you, Jesus. I thought you're the one exceeding sorrowful. 
I thought we're here to pray for you. You're saying this prayer meeting is about me. My spirit being willing, my flesh being weak. See, praying proactively protects our reaction. If we would pray proactive, it's going to help with the reactive. If we begin to pray before the storm comes, they, the storm was the furthest thing from their mind. Though Jesus even told them what was going to happen, they didn't have a clue. I mean, it, it caught them out of nowhere. And, but Jesus told them, I want you to pray. Even though I'm telling you what for, you, you, you're not even hearing me. Just hear this. Pray. Pray. Even though I'm trying to tell you what for, I want you to understand, pray, pray. And if you would pray in the proactive, it will help you in the reactive. Because there's something coming that you do not see. And if you would pray, I know you have a willing spirit, but your flesh, it's weak. Do not trust your flesh. It's going to betray you. It's going to lie on you. It's going to cave in. It's going to quit. But if you would pray, and because they didn't pray... See, our reactions are much different when our prayer is daily. When we are praying daily, our daily reactions will shift. They will change. And even when something comes out of the norm, outside of our routine day, when something comes out of nowhere, if we have been consistent and correct in prayer, you could pray consistently and pray incorrectly. That's what, that's what Jesus said to, about the Pharisee. They prayed consistently. They fasted consistently, but they prayed incorrectly and they fasted incorrectly. God, I don't want to pray consistently and pray incorrectly. I want to pray where this mind is stripped bare to the point of humble reliance. I do not trust myself. I am not righteous in of myself. I humbly rely on you. I have a willing spirit, but this flesh is weak. And so I pray again. I pray again. I pray again. Uh, This applies to outside these church walls and even within these church walls. You have two people in the same setting and have completely different responses. You could take two elements. You could take a block of clay and a block of ice under the same heating lamp and they respond very differently. One will harden to the heating lamp while the other melts before it. And so it is, you could have two different elements in the same atmosphere and respond very differently. When we are prayer conditioned, we are better positioned for a proper response. When we condition ourselves and discipline ourselves to pray daily, to talk to God in extended amounts of time, routinely, multiple times throughout the day, we are better positioning ourselves to have a right response. I do not want to be like a block of clay under a heating lamp that only hardens at the presence of that light. I want to be like that block of ice that under the presence of that light, I begin to give way and I begin to melt and I begin to move at the presence of it. God, help us to respond correctly to the light. Help us to respond correctly to your presence. Help us God to get to that point. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Matthew 17 verses 14 through 21. When they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man. Kneels down to Jesus and says, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic. I feel like I've said that a few times. But this boy was possessed with a devil. Fall on the fire, fall on the water. So he tells Jesus, I, I took him to your disciples. They couldn't cure him. And Jesus' response is not one of coddling or excuses. He says, faithless perverse generation. I don't want to be that generation. I want to be this generation. As the pastor talked about this morning, great lesson. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. Interesting, the statement of how long we did read 
that Jesus is long-spirited. That he is forbearing. That he is patient. Was that not the parable of Luke? And so, because he is long-suffering, doesn't mean that he wants us to continue to disobey him, because eventually that patient wears out. He says, bring him to me. And Jesus rebukes the devil. The devil comes out of him. The child's cured that very hour. So the disciples, embarrassed, sheepishly come take Jesus on the side and say, hey, a little insight, please. How come we couldn't cast out that devil? Jesus said, because of your unbelief. These are guys that have already cast out devils. These are guys that have been used in the miraculous. And now they're just wondering what's going on. And he says, you have unbelief. For I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. But how be it this kind, this kind of faith goes out not but by prayer and fasting. There are certain circumstances that require certain faith. And it's not a formula in which we are trying to say, well, if I fast this many days, I'm guaranteed this kind of miracle. If I pray this many days and I get this kind of devil cast out. It's just talking about there's some situations that you're up against that you do need an increase of faith. But that level of faith comes from a place of prayer and fasting. Now, it's interesting to note Jesus in this moment wasn't praying and fasting, but Jesus prayed and fasted prior And because he had prayer and fasting in his spiritual bank account, he had something to make a withdrawal and to have a breakthrough in this moment. This is where I feel very clear in direction for this church right now. Is that this church just came out a season of prayer and fasting. You may not have realized it, but it was for this season. It was for the season that we are in as a church, as a body, as a group of believers. And I feel that you need to hear from the Holy Ghost that you are prepared for this moment. A lot of times when we go into prayer, we go into fasting, we have an idea and we even will tag what we are praying and fasting for. But who could have known in the season of 40 days of prayer and fasting that we would be going through the season that we are going through right now? I believe Pastor Jared mentioned it, I believe, the other day in group prayer. Him and I talked about it on the side privately, just about a spirit of death, a season of sickness that has been coming upon this congregation. And not just that, but those connected to you. And in that season, in that era, in that moment, it is very easy for it to be counter faith, counterproductive to expect and believe the miraculous and the supernatural. It's one thing to say, I need God, but when you're in the midst of of that need when you're in the thick of that cloud and you do not see an instantaneous miracle you can get a little frustrated and say God why are you long forbearing why is it taking you so long to heal my kid why is it taking you so long to heal my body why is it taking you so long to heal brother so and so sister so and so why is it taking so long for you to interject into my situation Situation. We did not realize what we pray or how we pray, but the spirit itself makes intercession when you don't even know what you're praying for. When you're in a season of consecration, the spirit is taking you and preparing you for a season that you do not even see coming down the road. That's how powerful God is. And that's how much wiser our God is. Uh, You hear me, the spirit of death will not prevail. I'm going to say it by faith. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Some prayers build faith, but other prayers build faithfulness. There is a congregation here that has been filled with faith, but more importantly, you are faithful. And regardless what storm comes through this church, we will remain faithful. We will remain faithful. We will be steadfast. Fast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you could put that picture up, please. 
I, I, I've showed this before. I've talked about this picture before. I believe pastor has done the same thing as well. It's a powerful picture, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but this image is from Hurricane Michael uh, uh, back in, I think, 2018, and it basically obliterated the Gulf Coast. But it's a picture of a home that's still standing, and it provoked curiosity, and they found out whose home it was, and they asked questions about this home. And this retired doctor, this medical professional, basically began to share what he did to let This house stand as it does while there's devastation all around. And this seems virtually unscathed, untouched, unmarked, unmarred. And basically, he just talked about the process of him purchasing land there and finding out all the minimum requirements for you to build a home on the Gulf Coast, which is known in notorious for seasons of hurricanes that devastate the land. And there's all these minimum expectations and requirements Instead of him meeting the minimum expectation, he went deeper. He dug 40-foot pilings. He lowered the dimensions of the roof and tightened it down. He used specific types of screws beyond the minimum requirements to make sure no contrary wind will enter into that house and take the roof off of it. The lesson that you and I need to understand from this teacher called prayer is that I'm not telling you that you have to pray daily to go to heaven. I'm not saying you got to pray an hour a day to make it into heaven. But what I am letting you know is there is a season that is coming. A storm the likes of which you've never experienced before. And I thank God that you've been born again. But I'm telling you there's a storm that is coming. And what we need is a deeper pilings and the storm you will be able to survive it because you prayed daily because you dug deeper into the word of God it's not always about your salvation but it's about the season that you will be in that is making its way towards you but there are people in the storm of their life that do not withstand the winds of the storm because they did not go deep enough but I'm talking to some people right now that you have been in a season of prayer and fasting. You have put some 40 foot pilings in the ground. You have tightened the hatches in your home and because of that, this storm that is coming will not devastate a church that is ground. Last portion of scripture. Luke 21, 34 through 36. Some prayers build faith, others faithfulness. Jesus said, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. The cares of this life. There's that word care again. That is the distraction element of this life. The anxiety element of this life. The things that consume us in this life. Because if that happens, that day will come upon you unaware. But if we cast our cares on him. To to the one who's interested in us. The one who's concerned with us. If we would cast our thoughts unto him. Our anxieties unto him. That mellow comes. And that day will not catch us unawares. We will not be caught off guard. Jesus said in verse 36. Watch therefore and pray always. Watch therefore pray always. As we stand together. I feel just simply to remind you of something you already know is that you need to pray always and you need to cast your cares on him because he cares for you. And you thought you knew what you were preparing for. And I believe what you prepared for, you will see come to pass. But without realizing we were preparing for things we didn't know we were preparing for. And you are not going to be caught off guard unawares. What I feel to tell this congregation is the sickness and the death that is ensued on the season of this church. It will not be unto death. These stories will not be unto death. Now, do people die of sicknesses? That's a part of life. I understand it. But I believe God is going to turn many of the situations around where it will not be a sickness unto death. And what God wants to help you to identify in your mind, just like Jesus. 
days when Jesus prayed and fasted for 40 days and that devil was in front of him, Jesus was ready to cast it out. He had that faith to speak to that mountain. You have to realize the faith that you have in the mountain that's in front of you. You don't have to get into another season of praying and fasting to cast this mountain that's in front of us right now. This church jointly has come together in prayer. There's two people in this room that fasted 40 days. There's multiple that prayed, uh, fasted for 7, 14, 21 days, whatever the varying amounts are. I'm telling you, this church is ready to deal with sickness. This church is ready to deal with disease. This church is ready to deal with devils. This church is ready to deal with addiction. I thank God for 110 souls last week. Whatever souls come through this room, we are ready to deal with it because we have been taught by something called prayer. Would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice? And I pray God right now that you would release faith upon your people right now. Jesus, increase their measure of faith. Help them to understand and realize they have prepared for this season. This will not catch us unawares. This will not catch us off guard. We have prepared for this. We have prepared for this. We have prepared for this.